Welcome, everybody. We're going to start officially at about a minute after. So uh, just another 15 or 20 seconds. We're letting folks join and then we'll kick this off. OK, welcome, everybody. I'm just going to give a quick housekeeping item and then we'll turn it over to Tanya. Um, welcome to the webinar. And uh, as we proceed through the webinar, to ask questions, uh, go to the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel and uh, type in your questions there. If you have, if you'd like to remain anonymous, you can start your question with anon or anonymous or something like that. And uh, then Tanya won't read out your name as part of the as part of the question. With that, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Tanya. Great, thanks, Brett. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you today. Um, I'm going to start us off by inviting those of you in North America to proverbially spin your global, global Google globe around to the other side where uh, all five of us are joining you today. I want to just give a very quick welcome and um, notation of where we're all coming from. Um, we have five of us coming from various parts of Australia and New Zealand. And so just to help orient everyone, I'm Tanya Smith coming to you from Griffith University in the southeast corner of the great state of Queensland here on the map. Um, we're going to have presentations today ranging from New Zealand uh, at the South Island, the University of Otago, where Rebecca Kiniston's from. We're going to hear from Cyril Grouter of the University of Western Australia in Perth. We'll hear from Claire McFadden from the Australian National University located in the capital of Australia, uh, Canberra. And then finally, we'll hear from Andy Harris, who's coming to us from La Trobe University in Melbourne. I wanna also acknowledge that um, a number of us are members of our local professional society, which is the Australasian Society for Human Biology. And in fact, our uh, conference is coming up in just a couple months. And I wanna extend a warm welcome to anyone who wants to virtually zoom in to hear more about biological anthropology research in this region of the world. Um, the conference registration is quite modest. It's effectively the cost of membership for the year. And for students, that's about 15 US dollars. This is a very student-friendly conference. And so I really encourage people to reach out uh, and consider joining us this year. It'll run at about this time of day, so it should be accessible for most of you in North America and in Europe, uh, not so much. Um, and also just to mention that it's a student-friendly conference, so we really encourage uh, those of you who are just starting your careers to consider coming and sharing your research with us. So with no further ado, I see that we've got a, a good number of people on the call today. I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenter coming to us from the University of Otago, that's Rebecca Kinniston. Hello, uh, put my timer on. Hello, my name is Rebecca Kiniston. I'm a bioarchaeologist, a forensic anthropologist, and a research fellow at the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. Today I'll be talking about some bioarchaeological research that I have been involved with um, in Indonesia. So first off, I need to warn you that this talk does contain images of human skeletal remains, so please be aware. Indonesia is located um, northeast, oh, northwest of Australia, and it's a really exciting area to research because it has a very deep prehistory. Um, there's a number of hominin species that have been discovered in Indonesia, and new dating techniques have um, kind of uh, are, are finding out the new chronology of these hominid species, including Homo erectus and Homo floresiensis. We also have some other hominin um, species that have not been identified in both the uh, northern and southern islands. And anatomically modern humans came into the area between 60 and 70,000 years ago, and there's some new research coming out on prehistoric cave art, um, dating back to some of the earliest cave art in the world, and some um, early symbolic behavior in these northern islands of Borneo and Sulawesi as well. In the eastern islands, uh, new research has also come out showing 40,000 years of um, human occupation uh, on the island of Alor. And what these discoveries show is that there is kind of a growing understanding of the Pleistocene, but there are gaps in our understanding of the Holocene, especially the Neolithic period between 2,000 and 4,000 years ago. And that will, is what my talk will be about today. 
So early biological, bioarchaeological research in Indonesia um, first occurred in the early and mid 20th century. And this was colonial archaeology that was kind of collecting fossils and human remains and material culture. Um, but after independence, bioarchaeological research has been Indonesian led. And all foreign researchers must uh, build collaborative research projects with Indonesian um, archaeologists from the government or Indonesian universities. And there's a comprehensive permit and visa process for all foreign researchers in Indonesia. This is a shout out to my collaborator, Professor Tuti Kois Bardiati from the University of Erlanga in Surabaya, who I've been collaborating with since 2017. Um, and most skeletal remains are found accidentally as part of archeological excavations, or there are some focused um, excavations of burial grounds, one of which I'll be talking about later um, in the talk today. Um, there's also some skeletal material uh, that is curated by universities uh, from earlier excavations, and some of these are from the early 20th century. Now, as I said before, uh, Indonesia was first occupied by anatomically modern humans, we think between 60 and 70,000 years ago. During this time, Indonesia was a very different uh, place environmentally. The ocean levels were much lower. Um, and in the west, there was a large landmass now known as Sunda, which connected the western Indonesian islands uh, with mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, in the west, a uh, landmass of Sahul, which linked uh, New Guinea and Australia. In between Sunda and Sahul were the islands of Wallacea, which were never linked by uh, land bridges. Uh, what's new research is coming out that's suggesting that the northern route was the likely route where people were um, coming from Sunda into Sahul, uh, and there's the later southern route. What's important to realize here is that uh, Indonesia has been settled for many thousands of years since Pleistocene. Now, during the Neolithic, between 2,000 and 4,000 years ago, Austronesian-speaking people moved through the area and this is known as the largest maritime migration in prehistory. Um, Austronesian languages are spoken uh, from Madagascar in the west through uh, island Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia, and through the farthest reaches of Polynesia, including Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island, and New Zealand. So these Austronesian speakers are moving into an already settled island Southeast Asia, as it's been settled since the Pleistocene. And although the Austronesian language originated in Taiwan, there's complex interaction spheres within island Southeast Asia um, with people already settled there with other Austronesian groups, which we are still trying to unravel. It's interesting to think of this period as a Neolithic pulse of beliefs, material culture, and language that necessarily didn't come as one um, cohesive package. And we can see this Neolithic um, period in the archeological record by pottery, decorated and undecorated, um, shell and stone tools, and also uh, very distinct burial practices. There are not very many open settlement sites um, that have been found in Eastern Indonesia, and this might be due to the scarcity of sites of highly mobile groups, preservation uh, or environmental change. What we do have are some very distinct Neolithic cemeteries. And as bioarchaeologists, um, we can focus on these cemeteries and they can tell us a lot about the people because we can study the people themselves. There are four well-known Neolithic cemeteries in um, East Nusa Tenggara, and this is an area in, of Eastern Indonesia. Many of these were uh, excavated in the mid 20th century, but the one I'll be talking about today was excavated recently. This is the site of Pine Haka. It's located in the Northeast uh, Peninsula of Flores Island. And the site was formally identified in 2010. In 1992, there was a massive localized tsunami and this uh, destroyed the local village uh, and also removed about a meter or more of topsoil and this exposed the site. There is a full excavation of the site in 2012 and 48 burials with 55 interments were found. This was fully published in 2016 in Antiquity and most of the burials were found in two zones, zone six and zone five. And what these two areas had in common, or all the burials at the site, was that 
the people were interred with the Neolithic type material culture, including plain and decorated pottery, including jar burials as well, quadrangular stone adzes, which are axes, and there was also worked shell um, jewelry. What is important to realize is when these utilitarian um, items are placed in burial grounds, it shows that they were used for symbolic reasons as well. The burials were AMS dated to between 3000 and 2100 Cal BP. There's a variety of burial positions, every burial position that you can imagine, prone, supine, flexed, um, and there were single and multiple burials, jar burials, secondary burials, and bone removal as well after death. So these are some of the examples of the burials. These are two individuals with their heads removed after death. The legs of the individual on the right was actually disturbed and placed under the thorax of the individual on the left. This is a interment of at least four individuals. This is a person that had been disarticulated and put into a pot with a stone ax. Heads that had no bodies attached. Uh, flexed burials, supine with um, arms and legs flexed. So there was a huge variety of burial positions. This is fully published in this publication here, in this chapter. We have a number of questions surrounding Pine Haka and um, some of the methods in red that we've used to try to understand these questions or answer them. So we want to understand were these local or non-local people? What was the lifestyle and health of these people? What type of social organization did they have? And importantly, how does Pine Haka fit into the wider picture of the Neolithic settlement in island Southeast Asia and wider into the Pacific? Um, an example of this is a recent publication where we looked at tooth ablation, which is the ritual removal of teeth. Um, in this circumstance, it was the maxillary, lateral incisors and canines. And we found that Pine Haka and three other Neolithic cemeteries all showed um, evidence of this um, very highly visible body modification. And this was likely to signal that they were part of the same soci uh, sociocultural group um, for these highly mobile people in the region. We know that there was no settlement around the cemetery and that from dietary isotopes, we can see a mixed um, diet of broad spectrum foraging, especially marine foods of the reef and inshore environments and low level gardening, probably of locally adapted to tree and root tubers. Uh, the strontium isotopes show a high degree of mobility and these people kind of match what we see today in the region of the sea nomads. So people moving around, um, accessing resources from a number of different places. And we're kind of thinking, is Pine Haka a central place used to inter the dead? And do these variety of burial positions so show um, some type of um, cultural continuity uh, with the groups in the region, um, but also groups in the wider Pacific? So from the material culture and burial practices, are we seeing a pan-regional belief system that's associated with these pottery and especially jar burials and bone removal? We have a number of current research projects that we're delving into to try to publish our early results um, and also some more comparisons with uh, the regional Neolithic cemeteries and wider in, and also these uh, cemeteries wider into the Pacific that date to the same time period. And we're also looking at using trace element and isotope analyses to get individual life histories of people. Unfortunately, our 2020 excavation was delayed because of COVID and hopefully we'll come back um, next year to finish that. And what we'd really be interested in using ancient DNA to understand population dynamics in the region. And thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It was a lovely presentation. I want to invite, we've got time for a question or two. So if you're in the audience and you want to hear a little bit more about this specific research or uh, bioarchaeology in the broader uh, region, you've got time to type in a question. Um, I guess I'll fill a, a moment while people are typing by just asking, what do you think the prospects are for getting um, ancient DNA from some of these remains? Do you have a, a sense of whether that might be possible? As part of the collaborative project uh, with Professor Kois Bardiati, we have tried to get um, DNA from some of the other sites, including Liangua, um, which has 
Homo floresiensis, but they also has a Neolithic settlement uh, or cemetery in there in that cave. Um, and we haven't been successful in these other sites. So the interesting thing about Pine Haka is it seems much better preserved for some reason compared to these other sites. So I think that if we can um, collect Petra's bones, we might have a chance of getting ancient DNA. Mm. Wonderful. I, this idea of marine nomads is fascinating, but I've got a question. Let me pose this from Stephen Breyers. Is porotic hyperosteosis and or cribita orbitalia found in the skeletons? Yes, we did see evidence of um, that. I didn't have time to go into the paleopathology. Interestingly, the there's not many chronic diseases that we see, but we do see the parotic hyperostosis, and um, we think this might be uh, related to parasites, um, but that's something we'll have to delve into uh, more in the publications. Wonderful. One more question from Leslie Halesco. Do you have any idea of what the faces in the pottery represent? And she's referring to your last slide. Uh, well, faces and pottery is actually very uh, typical of this Neolithic Austronesian settlements. We see this in the Pacific, but there, it's more the specialty dentate stamped um, pottery that looks like kind of tattooing. Um, these uh, applique faces, uh, we're not 100% sure, but it is uh, typical of this kind of pan regional belief system and that these um, Buried or this pottery with faces are in the burial grounds means that it is important spiritually. And uh, we love to see more examples of this uh, Neolithic cemeteries across the region. Fascinating. Well, thanks so much, Rebecca. We appreciate you keeping the time and uh, giving us a broad overview of bioarchaeology in the region. Uh, if anybody would like to contact Rebecca for further information, we encourage you to do so. I'm going to have our next speaker take the stage now. Cyril is up from the University of Western Australia. Uh, yes, hi everyone. I'm Cyril Gruder. I'm a primatologist and biological anthropologist. I'm originally from Switzerland, but I've been working at the University of Western Australia since 2012. All right, let me uh, dive straight into my talk, which is on secondary sexual traits and complex sociality in primates. So if we look at primates, we know that primates are well known for their male bias, body size, dimorphism. The classic examples are gorillas and mandrills. But some primates also have conspicuous secondary sexual traits. For example, the elongated nose of the proboscis monkey, the manes of the hamadryas baboon, or the reddened chest of the gelada. Uh, another example would be the upper lip ward of the golden snub-nosed monkey here. So there's really two kinds of sexually dimorphic secondary trait in um, primates. Um, there's ornaments and there's weaponry. Ornaments really have a dual function. They play a role in male-male competition and female choice. For males, ornaments may provide information on the social status and the fighting ability of a rival. So males can use these batches of status to assess how risky it is to pick a fight with a rival and imminent conflicts can be resolved without the need for escalation. But some of these ornaments also signal male quality to choosy females. So they are true ornaments or billboards for females, so to speak. Now, weaponry, on the other hand here, um, includes weapons such as canines, but also body mass dimorphism. Weapons are used in male-male contest, and some of these weapons can also be used to inflict lethal wounds, for example, canines uh, in chimpanzees. Um, so in primates, the best known example of a weapon, as I just said, uh, are canines, in large canines. What about true ornaments? These are used in female mate choice. Uh, this is an example from the literature. Uh, we know that rhesus macaque males with darker facial coloration, they receive more sexual solicitations from more females than paler faced males. So the motto here is the redder, the better. And here's a few examples of likely batches of status that are used in male-male competition. For example, in Chiladas, harem leaders have redder chests than bachelor males. And this is from our own research here. We know that black and white snub-nosed monkey males, uh, the one male unit holders in, the, in this species are much redder than the bachelor males during the mating season. Uh, 
I, I meant the lips of the one mil unit uh, holders are much redder than those of the bachelors. And we also know from humans that women and men ascribe bearded faces higher social status. Now, the importance of secondary sexual traits may vary depending on the size and composition of a social group. It's very well established that sexual dimorphism and by inference uh, mating competition is higher in multi-male groups and in single male groups than in monogamous groups. In multi-male groups, that's because males have to compete with other males over sexual access to females. In single male groups, it's because males have to compete um, to monopolize a group of females. Now, uh, sorry, going back here. Yeah. So male ornaments are also important in large groups where individuals are surrounded by lots of other individuals which they don't know very well. So here ornaments facilitate rapid recognition of male status, quality, and this is important for both male rivals but also for females looking for a mating partner. Now, on the other hand, if you live in a smaller group, you can individually recognize your fellow group members through repeated interactions, and you can get to know them and their strengths and their status and their quality. So there's really no need to display these um, fancy external ornaments. And one study has shown that group size is a strong predictor of complexity of facial color patterns in old world monkeys and apes. And lastly, sexual selection also continues after mating in the form of sperm competition, which leads to larger testes. It is costly for males to invest in both ornaments and ejaculates. So we expect allocation trade-offs between ornaments, which are pre-copulatory traits, and ejaculates, which are post-copulatory traits. So the prediction here is that increased expenditure on sperm such, an, such as in this chimpanzee here, should be associated with decreased expenditure on ornaments. But how males invest in ornaments relative to other sexual traits was not really known until we did the study that I'm going to briefly present in a minute. So we predicted that if male ornaments serve as batches of status, they should trade off with investment in testes. Now let me briefly shift gear here and talk a little bit about multi-level societies because I want to explore how sexual selection operates in a multi-level system. So this is a primate social system that until recently had not really been considered in discussions of secondary sexual traits. We know that multi-level societies exist in a handful of primates such as gelatas and snub-nosed monkeys. And I've done quite a bit of work on multi-level societies. So here's a definition, core units maintain proximity and coordinate activities with other core units and thereby form one or more successively higher levels of grouping. You can see the core unit at the top here and then there's increasingly um, higher levels of groupings as you move to the bottom here. And here you can see the structure of a multi-level system for three different species. There's some differences among species, but what all of them have in common is that there are two social layers, the one male unit and the higher level band. And there's often also bachelor groups here at the periphery. And humans essentially also live in a multi-level um, society. Now, I came up with three predictions here. So the first one was about sexual dimorphism. Here we looked at Asian colobines, which exhibit a wide range of sexual dimorphism in body mass. Some species are monomorphic, whereas others, um, such as rhinopithecus, are strongly dimorphic. And there are basically two types of social organization in Asian colobines. There's multi-level societies and there's non-multi-level societies. In non-multi-level societies, the core units, the one male units, they forage independently and do not mingle with others. So we predicted um, that body mass dimorphism should be higher in species with multi-level societies. And that's because one male unit males are more or less in permanent proximity and thus experience frequent and intense competition over mating access to females. And the one male units are also shadowed by bachelor groups, which also compete with the resident males over access to females. So here we extract the data from the literature to test this prediction. Uh, moving on to the second uh, prediction or second study here. Um, we predicted that ornaments should be more pronounced in larger, more anonymous groups and in species with multi-level societies. In anonymous groups, that's because individual recognition is limited and conflict potential is probably high. So what is needed here is a quick, reliable assessment of male quality, 
which is important to females, and male status, which is important to other males. And we also predicted that ornaments should be more pronounced in species with multi-level societies than in species with other types of social system, because in multi-level societies, the one male unit males, they're constantly in close contact, so there's heightened conflict potential. So here we did a comparative study across primates, and this brings me to the last study. Um, we predicted um, that ornaments and canines should trade off um, with testes size. And again, here we did a comparative study across primates. All right, so this was these were collaborations with a number of people. I don't have the time to go into that right now. So as for the first study, um, remember, we said that body mass dimorphism should be higher in species with multi-level societies. We did indeed find support for that prediction. Sexual dimorphism in body weight was significantly higher in multi-level species than in non-multi-level species. And this was, suggests that living in a multi-level society is associated with higher levels of male-male competition. As for the second study, that ornaments should be more pronounced in larger, more anonymous groups and species with multi-level societies, what we did here is we visually inspected photographs and scored all hairy, fleshy, and colorful ornaments um, in 154 species of New World monkeys, Old World monkeys, and apes, including humans. And then we quantified sexual dimorphism in every ornament using a six-point Likert scale. Just to give you an idea of uh, how we did that, for example, uh, now, this is the moustache of the emperor tamarine. So this one received a score of zero because the moustache is equally expressed in males and females, whereas the nose of the proboscis monkey received a score of five. That's because the male has a much larger and uh, pe more pendulous nose uh, than the female, which has a little snub nose. And the gelada, the rest chest patch of the gelada received an intermediate score here. And in the case of humans, we included the occurrence of facial hair. And then we summed those scores for each species for a total ornamentation value, which ranged from 0 to 32. And the main model predictors were group size and social organization, but we also controlled for a few potentially confounding variables, such as fission fusion and habitat type. And here's the results. As you can see, there was a positive um, relationship between group size and sexual dimorphism in ornamentation as predicted. And if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that in primates with a multi-level social system, sexual dimorphism in ornamentation was much higher than in any of the other social systems um, that we tested. And as for the last um, study that ornaments should uh, and canines should trade off with testes size. We did a comparative analysis. Again, testes size was used as a proxy for post-copulatory selection, and ornaments and canine size were uh, the pre-copulatory traits. And we did indeed find that uh, relative testes size decreased with um, sexual ornaments. And as far as I know, this is the first large-scale study to show that ornaments trade off with testes in um, any um, um, mammal group. Interestingly, canines and testes, they were positively correlated, and this difference in the direction of the relationship of testes with ornaments and weapons is quite interesting. I don't have a good explanation. Um, it's possible that ornaments have a dual function, and there's evidence that this is the case. They play a role in both male-male competition and female choice, so ornaments may be under more intense sexual selection than canines, that are involved primarily in male-male competition. It's also possible that male ornaments are functionally less constrained than canines, and so have the potential to become more exaggerated. And lastly, canine maintenance may only require minimal metabolic investments after reaching sexual maturity, whereas uh, exaggerated ornaments, they might require more or less continuous investment. So these are potential explanations for this um, diverging pattern that we found here. All right, let me summarize these three strands of research here. We found higher body mass dimorphism in multi-level colobines, which means that living in a multi-level society intensifies mating competition among males. And as for the second study, the media think that we explained why hipsters grow beards. I'm not sure if that's what we explained. What we, I think what we really explained is the higher degree of ornamentation in larger groups and multi-level societies, which reflects selection for 
amplified signals of individual identity, status or attractiveness in large and complex social groups where conflict may arise frequently and individual recognition is limited. And lastly, according to some media outlets, we showed that men with longer beards have smaller balls. I think what we really showed is that ornament elaboration comes at the expense of testes size and sperm production. So the showiest males have the smallest testes. So you can be well adorned or well endowed, but it's hard to be both. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thanks, Cyril. That was quite provocative. <laughs> Um, we've got time to take a question, and I'm just going to pop up my question box and see what I've got um, while I'm waiting for anybody to type in. I'm curious about broader trends um, outside of primates, uh, particularly in terms of your third conclusion. Have, it, have anybody looked at this in, in non-primate mammals in terms of the relationship between uh, test size and ornamentation? Um, there's quite a bit of research looking at trade-offs between canines and um, uh, and testes, but no one's really looked at ornaments or ornamental dimorphism, so to speak. So that was really a first. And interestingly, we found this diverging pattern where ornaments were negatively correlated with testes, but canines were actually positively correlated with testes. So the links awesome. between weapons and testes are much better researched than the links between ornaments and uh, testes. How about exceptions? I'm still waiting. Uh, we've got about a minute for another question, but are, were there any primate exceptions that really sort of befuddled you in terms of the broad survey that you've uh, conducted? Oh, there was a bit of variation, but uh, there wasn't a, a clear outlier in our data set. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Cyril. Uh, we've got an uh, opportunity for people to follow up with you individually. Any questions that get typed in after talks will be forwarded because your uh, associated information gets passed on. So if anybody has a uh, question for Cyril or for Rebecca that they didn't have time to pose, uh, please do go ahead and forward that in to us and we'll make sure that that gets to our speakers. Uh, really appreciate your time today. We're going to move on to our third speaker and uh, that's Claire. Claire McFadden coming to us from the Australian National University. And I wanted to just remind people what we're giving you today is a very broad and general survey. So we're trying to cover various subfields within biological anthropology. And Claire's going to take us into paleodemography and paleoepidemiology. So I'll turn the floor over to her now. Great. Right, thank you, Tanya. Um, first up, um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the First Nations people um, of the land that I'm on today, which is the Ngunnawal people. Um, and pay my respects to um, elders past and present. Um, my talk today, <clears throat> apologies, I've got a bit of cold. Um, my talk today is probably a little bit more nebulous um, than the talks we've had so far. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how I see um, bioarchaeology fitting into multidisciplinary approaches to paleodemography and paleoepidemiology moving forwards. Um, so first, just introducing um, paleodemography and where things sort of stand at the moment. Um, we've got a, a, quite a long history of um, paleodemographic research um, going back several decades, um, sort of the early um, paleodemographic studies, whether they're defined that way or not, sort of date to the 1950s. So it's got um, some antiquity, these um, sort of studies of um, population dynamics into the past. And like any discipline, um, when we have that sort of that sort of history to it, um, we often end up with some assumptions embedded in the study of these disciplines moving forwards. Um, I think for paleodemography, um, some of the things that have um, have lingered on through through its study and haven't necessarily evolved um, at the rate that some other um, disciplines have is is this concept of um, anthropological or modern hunter-gatherer populations being comparable to um, populations in the deep past. Um, and when I talk about anthropological and modern hunter-gatherer populations, I'm talking about populations that are um, at least by us as Westerners perceived to um, live in traditional sort of life ways. Um, one of the issues with this in comparing to the past um, is that um, we're looking at uh, very diverse uh, populations over uh, typically quite short periods of time. Um, and so if we're looking at population dynamics, they tend to be more volatile in smaller communities over shorter period of time, periods of time, and more stable in um, larger populations over longer periods of time. 
So whether our anthropological or modern hunter-gatherer um, populations actually have any affinities with our populations in the past is unclear. We've also been a little bit environmentally, environmentally deterministic, and we expect to see these quite simple and linear relationships. A topic that I find has been um, sort of overwhelmingly missing from the discussion of paleodemography is agency and how agency um, impacts fertility and population growth um, and how it relates to mortality as well um, and, and observing the deaths of others and how that may um, influence um, one's decisions in life, which then um, feed back into population dynamics. Um, we also have quite a lot of limitations, um, pretty traditional of bioarchaeology to have quite a lot of limitations, um, methodologically and also in terms of the data available to us. Um, and, and obviously these two factors interact um, very strongly. So um, in terms of methods, um, there hasn't been a huge amount of methodological development in the bioarchaeology space um, in relation to um, paleodemography. Um, however, in other areas, we have seen um, sort of a recent surge in terms of um, using um, spatial distribution of radiocarbon dates, um, which sort of seeks um, to identify peaks and troughs in um, the number of radiocarbon dates in a region, which may be indicative of, of more sites um, developing, which may suggest population growth. Um, and equally, when that declines, it may suggest a decline in population growth. But in the bioarchaeology space, there was sort of a bit of a stagnation with that. We didn't see a huge lot of methodological development. Um, the data itself, as with any bioarchaeology, is, is a bit problematic. We have um, quite a, we're, well, I guess we're subject to all of the limitations that the rest of bioarchaeology are. So, um, you know, that includes things like uh, the inaccuracy or the imprecision of, of age death estimation, um, issues with preservation. And I think one of the major ones um, is uh, in terms of precision is the time. So, you know, often when we're looking at um, skeletal remains, we're looking at a lower and an upper um, period of time. So the earliest date and the latest date. Um, so we're dealing with ranges. We don't know when the people actually lived in terms of, you know, on a year to year basis, um, when they were deposited into, um, into the uh, burial or into the sample. Um, and so that can be a little bit problematic when we're trying to look at um, changes in the population. In terms of the research questions, there has been, um, I guess, a, a, a focused um, temporary spatial sort of area. So we've seen um, quite a lot of research in, um, in the Americas um, and in Europe, um, less so in the rest of the world. There has been sort of um, dabbled interest in the Pacific. Um, and in terms of the time period, I mean, some of this is dictated by the data available. Um, but some of it has been due to um, a focus on particular events, which is understandable, you know, things like the agricultural transition, um, which are these major events that we expect to have huge demographic consequences. Um, so the research questions have been a little bit limited in scope. In terms of paleoepidemiology, um, I think uh, it's a little bit different. Um, not as long antiquity in terms of the, the study of this area. It's been a bit more of a, a recent area of study, um, this extrapolation of, of paleopathologies to the population level. Um, but again, similar to um, paleodemography, it's underpinned by the same limitations as um, paleopathological studies, such as um, you know, the non-specificity of some of the lesions or you know, inability to diagnose conditions from skeletal lesions. Um, inability to identify the time of occurrence of lesions, um, so when someone was actually sick, um, inability to tell the cause of death and the fact that many diseases don't manifest skeletally. In terms of research questions, again, we gravitate to these major sort of disease events. Um, there has been um, quite a bit of work in recent years around more common conditions um, and more generalized conditions, so things like nutritional deficiencies rather than um, specific pathogens. So what are we doing going forward? So a lot of my work in this area has been focused on methodologies, um, but I, I guess we're sort of, now that we've got that foothold in terms of refining um, methods, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly, um, we're moving into the space of, you know, what's the theoretical framework we work within and, and how do we really start to um, gain some really interesting insights into how people and how populations lived and operated in the past. So we want to reduce the reliance on um, historical and modern comparisons and move more so to generalized patterns. 
Um, environment is certainly a factor, but we want to consider it as one of many in a very complex and dynamic relationship between populations um, and their environments. Um, but also the um, dynamics of the population do not have a simple linear relationship with um, either external, in, um, internal, or extrinsic and intrinsic factors. Um, these are very dynamic and very complex relationships, and we want to put agency back into it. So in terms of addressing those limitations, we're trying to refine and expand um, the methodologies available for looking at bioarchaeology um, or looking at paleodemography through the bioarchaeological lens. Um, and we're trying to work in many cases within the limitations of the discipline. So how do we deal with the um, imprecision of dating? Um, how do we find um, viable comparisons for that? And, and one of the things we've been looking at um, under the assumption that some of the, um, the samples that we deal with are deposited over a significant period of time, we're looking at um, longer spans of data, um, as well as larger populations that may have more stabilization than, than some of the um, small populations that have been used for comparison or for modeling in the past. We want to have a really well considered and really well incorporated theoretical basis drawing on um, various different disciplines, and I'll discuss a bit of uh, a couple of examples of that in a moment. Um, but we want to reach out to you know all our colleagues in biological anthropology, um, colleagues in archaeology, um, colleagues in demography and, and philosophy, um, to try and have a um, much more um, holistic approach to, to paleodemography. So in terms of moving forwards, um, I've spoken a bit about this, but we want to expand that temporospatial scope in terms of the um, uh, research questions that we're asking. We want to look outside of major events, both in terms of disease and um, technology, because most of human history happens outside of these major events. Um, and they are certainly of interest, but it's also, um, I think, of interest to start looking into these narratives of um, how uh, people lived and, and how they interacted with their community and how communities interacted with others uh, and these dynamic variables that are at play. Um, just in sort of what we would consider day-to-day um, -day life rather than um, necessarily hinging it to these sort of major events. We want to look at the ability to shift the resolution, so zooming in and out on, um, on populations. So we can look at the individual within the population, we can look at the family, we can look at the community within population dynamics. And I think this is a real strength of bioarchaeology um, in a complementary approach with, with some of the other methodologies. Um, because we are unique in that ability to zoom in on the individual um, and look at that. So we're looking to refine and expand the methods, um, explore temporospatially diverse samples, contexts, and, and different questions to what we have in the past and incorporate theory and evidence into a multidisciplinary approach. As I spoke about, we're changing the resolution. We want to account for or at least discuss the complexity, um, agency, and the dynamic relationships. And this is aimed at um, providing enhanced narratives. So a few examples, which I'm going to go through really quickly, because as usual, I'm running a bit behind. Um, so human ancestors is one of the things that we've been really interested in, in terms of changing that temporal focus. We're using bioarchaeological methods of estimating population dynamics, but then we're drawing on our colleagues in primatology and paleoanthropology to get a better understanding of non-human primate um, maturation fertility and mortality, so life history, um, understanding um, how we can, um, I guess, adjust the, um, the human methodologies to fit um, our human ancestors. Um, and the aim of this is to provide insights into um, human ancestral population dynamics. Um, so this is one example of, of drawing of, on our colleagues in biological, within biological anthropology um, and, and collaborating strongly um, to try and um, use some of these uh, paleodemographic studies in a context um, that we haven't necessarily done so before using bioarchaeological methods. Um, some other work we're doing is in the Pacific Islands, um, looking at um, samples throughout the Pacific Islands, a really interesting and really diverse region. Um, we're looking at paleodemography and skeletal lesions, and then we're incorporating information like epidemiological and clinical data about the impacts of disease on things like fertility. Um, we're looking at historical accounts of disease, but also ethnography 
around um, sexual behaviours and marriage, um, and then incorporating um, with colleagues from archaeology, paleoclimate, cultural artefacts, faunal remains, aimed at understanding how populations respond to disease, um, ecology, and giving this continuity of population history. And very quickly, um, in, so I've talked about temporal um, and also um, spatial changes in focus. We're also looking at different research questions. So the female experience is one that I'm particularly interested in. Um, looking at bioarchaeological estimates of fertility, maternal mortality, as well as health. We're then again using the epidemiological and clinical literature on um, maternal and infant uh, morbidity and mortality to understand what we might be observing. But we're also looking at behavioural ecology in terms of the interaction of maternal mortality and fertility, which in uh, many cases is sort of seen as a cyclic thing with um, higher fertility, meaning more exposure to maternal mortality, but then an increase in maternal mortality can shift behaviours. Um, and so women um, may um, opt not to have as many children. So understanding um, the female experience of fluctuations in population dynamics, um, but then also how the female experience may feed into those population dynamics. So just a more sort of comprehensive way of looking at it. So I've covered this before, we're, just to wrap up, we're looking to refine and expand these methods. We're looking to apply them in new contexts, incorporate and collaborate um, with multiple disciplines, which gives us this ability to sort of shift resolutions from a bioarchaeological perspective, um, and gives us um, these enhanced narratives around complexity, agency, and um, these dynamic relationships. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, we've got about one minute and one question come in from Georgia Rolls, who asks, in terms of agency, how much power do you think this may have had in population size? Where do you draw the line in theorizing about its possibilities and effects? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it is obviously a very challenging area looking at agency. Um, I think in terms of drawing a line, we are um, trying to be appropriately cautious um, when we're looking at agency, that a lot of this is speculative. Um, but I think drawing on modern examples of how agency factors into fertility, I mean, a really great example is um, rolling out of, um, of contraceptives. Uh, that the success of rolling out contraceptives in um, on the African continent versus in Southeast Asia was very, very different. Um, and uh, there's been some anthropological studies and surveys which have suggested that a lot of this is due to the fact that in Southeast Asia at the time when um, free contraceptives were being rolled out, uh, women were seeing increasing economic participation. And so they were actually wanting to take up the opportunity of um, contraceptives. Um, where it was rolled out in um, on the African continent, um, there was uh, less uptake and that was said to be um, by choice um, by women because they wanted to have large families. Um, they didn't necessarily have um, the opportunities that um, counterparts in Southeast Asia had. Um, and so it, it became an opt out from contraceptives. So I think in terms of, um, you know, and obviously we're not suggesting that people um, using uh, contraceptives in that way. I think it does show though that um, that female agency can have a, a significant impact in terms of fertility. Fascinating. Thank you so much Claire. I want to make sure that our final speaker Andy gets his full 15 minutes. Uh, we do have an anonymous question come in and a follow-up so we'll forward those questions on to you so you have a chance to engage uh, more fully. Thank you again for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to Andy now. Okay, um, thank you for having me. So my name is Andy Harris. I'm currently the Head of Department of Archaeology and History at La Trobe University in Melbourne. Uh, I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional custodians. I'd like to pay my respect as, as respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to Aboriginal elders of other communities that may be here today. And my paper does include skeletal remains. So today I'm talking about uh, hominid discoveries and dating work at the site of Drimelin in South Africa. I had hoped to share with you some very nice new hominid fossils that we've got, but that's all under embargo, so you'll have to wait till the journal papers come out. 
Um, Dremelin is a now eight year collaboration for me, kindly um, funded by the Australian Research Council and in collaboration with the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, the Paleo Research Institute. Um, so the, one of the first things I want to acknowledge is that ultimately my background, I'm mostly a geologist um, and I work on the dating of human fossils. Uh, so there is a huge group of people as part of the Dremelin Research Project that you can sort of see here. We run a field school each year. Unfortunately, due to COVID, this did not run this year and will not likely run next year, but we have hopes for the future. Um, but some key people, uh, my collaborator and co-permit holder at Dremelin, Stephanie Baker in South Africa, um, Katie Nikosi, and her, who's the Dremelin landowner, who without any of this uh, wouldn't be happening and wouldn't continue to happen. Very supportive. He's come on our excavations, which has been absolutely amazing. And he's even found some hominid fossils, which is cool. David Strait at Washington of University in St. Louis, who helps run the field school. Uh, and then my PhD students, uh, or Angie is now finished, Angeline Lease, who sort of led the hominid work there over recent years, and Jesse Martin, who's finishing his PhD working on hominid material. So if you don't know the South African hominid localities, um, almost everything that we know about South African hominids comes from a very small area just outside of Johannesburg, everything that's older than about 1.1 million years, apart from the sites of Taung, and the site of Mokapanskat, which is a little bit further to the north. But the vast majority comes from this area, and the vast majority of material comes from sites like Stokefontein and Swartkrans. Trimelin is a little bit further to the north of those, just to orient you. And when we talk about cave sites, what we're actually talking about most of the time is big holes in the ground where the roofs of the caves have been eroded off, and miners have come in and mined out some of the sections. So they've always been complex places for understanding chronology and association of fossils because some of this material has been excavated over about 100 years. If we look at Drimlin Cave itself, um, you can see here an aerial shot, and we've actually now got two sites. There is the what we now call Drimlin Main Quarry, or DMQ, which was discovered in 1992 by Andre Kayser, and is where all the hominid material comes from. And then there's another site called Drimlin Macondo, or DMK, which was first excavated in about 2013 which is significantly older. And the two caves are not connected, but they're very close to each other and they're quite different ages, which is creating some interesting results. We quickly look at DMQ. DMK, you can see it's a heavily eroded deposit. We've done cosmogenic dating that suggests that about 10 meters have been eroded off here over the last 2.6 million years. It doesn't have any hominid material. If we did find it, it would be Australopithecus. We've dated it via paleomagnetism, uranium lead, and uranium series electron spin resonance for about 2.61 million years. And it's an amazing site because it has lots of articulated remains, articulated skeletons, uh, things like Parapapio, uh, Matriticaris andrusi, which is a really good sort of um, chronological marker in the pigs, um, and things like Dinophilus, Barlowi, and Chasmoporthetes. So this is giving us a window into that period of time, 2.6 million years ago, where Australopithecus lived on the landscape. DMQ itself um, is most famous probably for DNH7, which was a, the most complete Paranthus robustus cranium or skull ever discovered in 1994 by Andre Kayser, so during early years of excavation. Also found some other remains such as DNH7, uh, which suggested sort of a male and female uh, of that species. As I say, the vast majority of material has come from here. This now totals over 150 odd hominid specimens mostly found between 94 and 2007, mostly consisting of isolated teeth, mostly of Paranthropus, but some early homo material like DNH 36, no, 39, which you can call, you see there. I put DNH 122 up because uh, it's the first fossil I ever found at the site, the first hominid I ever pulled out the ground, so it has a little special place in my heart. Um, but we have this big question we found you know, in the very early years, found this complete cranium, but almost everything else that was found since then was all isolated teeth. So we really wanted to understand, well, why is that? Um, part of the reason is that we look at the site um, from west to east. There's a whole section of the site that is in situ, um, breccia uh, that's come through a vertical entrance. There's an area of collapse, which is where the DNH7 cranium come, came from, this sort of big collapse block in the middle. And then there's a load of miners rubble. And a lot of the early excavations were in this sort of central collapsed area because it's very easy to excavate as an archaeological excavation. Um, and perhaps that was sort of one of the reasons. 
Excavating at Drummond Macondo has given us some idea. So Macondos are named after these solution features where tree roots come down into the breccia and dissolve it. And what we began to find is that in the middle of these features, we don't find any bone, whereas around the edges of the features, we find lots and lots of bone, which you can see there in these little red dots. And they often occur in these little clusters. Um, they're often articulated. And so there is a significant sort of component to losing certain materials during the process of sort of how these sites have been eroded. So we sort of took that and we started doing sort of more targeted excavations of specific areas in the main quarry. And almost immediately that started um, yielding sort of results in the fact that we started finding more complete material other than isolated teeth. So an example here is DNH-152, which we published in Science earlier in the year, Paranthropus robustus cranium found by Keti Nikosi and Abby Yeager and Eunice, um, who are now both ASU PhD students or undergrads at the time. Um, so we now have sort of both male and female sort of examples of Paranthropus robustus craniums from the site, which is sort of nice. Um, the other cranium that we found uh, is DNH-134, which is named Simon after our very long-term co collaborator who unfortunately um, died a few years ago. Um, and he's very, very sorely missed. But this is now the most complete uh, early homo cranium from South Africa. There are a number of other, um, so this, we think estimate it's about a 1.5 to three year old, has its closest affinities to Homo erectus, um, was originally found by Richard Curtis in 2015, who when he excavated it thought it was a baboon because it was so thin and it was in so many pieces, he didn't initially realize that it was sort of a homo cranium. Um, is obviously is just the cranial vault, so that does make comparisons to other Homo erectus material more difficult, but it does share, um, you know, it's extremely similar to the Modicurto cranium, which is the only uh, Homo erectus uh, cranium that we have of a similar sort of age. It has an estimate of about 538 cc in cranial capacity, which is uh, a bit less than Modicurto, um, but it's not that far away from some other um, Homo erectus remains, particularly the Dan 5 P1 cranium, which was found recently. Um, if we look at what, what else do we know about Homo in South Africa, well, it's a little bit of a ragtag uh, material. We've got lots of Paranthropus uh, material. We've got things like the STW53 cranium, which has been reconstructed by a number of different people to get very different results. So it's been argued to be Homo habilis, but uh, Ron Clark has argues that it's Ospithicus africanus. The age of it uh, is somewhat problematic as well. It's been dated to 1.8 to 1.6, at some points older than 2 million. Then we have things like SK847, it's about 1.8 million years from a site of Swartkrans. And then we've got a number of mandibles um, like SK45, um, SKX21204 um, and SK15, uh, obviously, which are not directly comparable to us. And then we have things like Hominaledi, which are obviously much, much younger. They're sort of 300,000 years old. Um, <clears throat> Now, part of the problem of understanding sort of drilling into these other sites has been the dating of the sites in South Africa. Obviously, in East Africa, they've got a lot of volcanic material. They're able to date this via argon argon, sometimes with uh, paleomagnetism. We don't have that in South Africa. Um, and so we've had to come up with other ways of doing it. Robin Pickering, my long term collaborator uh, and a scientist extraordinaire, um, and I published a paper in Nature recently for many, many years of work where we actually began to show that you get the same flowstones forming in different cave sites in the region. Um, so you can identify the same flowstones in different caves. So we can now, for the first time, start to actually build a picture up across the landscape and connect these stratigraphies by using flowstones in the same way that we use tephra in East Africa. Um, what we're now doing is adding uranium series electron spin resonance into the mix, paleomagnetism into the mix, to then use that to refine the ages between some of these flowstones, because some of the gaps between the flowstones can be, you know, 500,000 years. And using those other methods, we can refine that down. And so this is sort of a work in progress for the cradle. If we take an example of that, uh, Swartkrans member one hanging remnant, Robin dated this between about 2.25 and about 1.8 million years, so quite a large time gap. Um, but there's some old ESR ages when ESR was a little bit problematic. So I'm hoping that some new ESR will be done at this site and some paleomagnetism, there's a reversal in there somewhere that will help us to refine those ages. At the moment, I, I think that it's probably closer to the 1.8 million year age in part, partly because that basal flowstone that you can see there where the red line is, is heavily, heavily truncated before deposition. So I think it's probably close to the younger age. Um, <clears throat> 
Swartcron's member one hanging uh, lower bank is another sort of site that has some dates. Uh, Cosmogenics in this case, again, similar sorts of ages and uranium lead about sort of 2.2 to 1.8 million years. And hopefully there will be further refinement of this. Um, this is meant to be a little bit older than hanging remnants. So it's a good question about how old this is. There's not so many complete fossils from this. Um, there's one homo uh, specimen, which is SKX21204, which uh, Fred Bryan classified as homo. At Drimelin, what will I hope will happen all of these sites and including sites like Cromdry, which also have very interesting and comparable material is that we begin to get these sort of multidisciplinary studies. At Drimelin, we are able to sort of date the site very securely to between about 2.04 and 1.95 million years by combining the ESR ages with paleomagnetism and uranium lead. Uh, we were very lucky here in part because there's a magnetic reversal that actually happens as the site is being deposited, which means we know that there's a, a layer that is 1.95 million years. All the hominid material is older than that, so we know it's older than 1.95 million years. And then we've used the ESR to give us that sort of upper age limit. And we've got a whole load of hominid fossils there, some of which we've published, some of which will hopefully be published very soon. Um, ultimately, what this is all telling us is something about this transition between Australopithecus on the landscape and Paranthropus and early Homo on the landscape in the first stone tools. Um, and, you know, this idea that there is a transition, a faunal turnover is a long held one. The work of Elizabeth Verber very early on sort of showed this to be the case. But what we're now being able to do with these new sites and fossils and the dating is being able to refine that. So it's often been seen that there was this sort of climatic sort of change and there's suggested it might happen about 2.2 million years ago. Um, but there was a stark turnover. Australopithecus went from the landscape and then the new species sort of arrived. What we've been able to show for the first time at Drimelin conclusively, although some of the other sites may also show this, is that we um, have got Australopithecus still around on the landscape at sites like Malapa at 1.98 million years. So at the same time, Drimelin is being deposited. So we have Australopithecus, Paranthropus, early Homo erectus, maybe more than one species of homo on the landscape at the same time and that's some of the work that we need to do now on all of that so this sort of gives you an overview the ones in red are what we've got in south africa so we've got sediba as this latter part of australopithecus homo erectus or agasta if you prefer um Paranthropus robustus and then maybe some other species specimens of homo homo habilis or something else and then later on uh, homo naledi obviously we do see these same transitions in the fauna so it's not just the hominids where this is occurring we have these same transitions from things like Dinophilus barlowi to Dinophilus pivotoi, this false toothed cat, cat. But again, at Drimelin for the first time, we have both these species at the site at the same time. So we're seeing this sort of change in this overlap in both the hominid and the non-hominid record. And what does this all mean? Well, I mean, ultimately, you know, this is part of, I think, sort of things that are happening globally in hominid evolution at this time. At this same time period, we've got some form of hominid in China making stone tools between 2.14 and 1.98 million years. We know that Homo erectus is moving out of Africa at this time period. And we don't often talk about movement in Africa. We also talk about out of Africa. But you know, South Africa and East Africa are 4,000 kilometers away. They're very different. So this is sort of now the task for the future is to try and understand all of these mechanisms. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Andy. We're all virtually applauding and appreciating your time with us today. Uh, I've got about 45 seconds for a question, or uh, if nothing pops in the box, what I will uh, confess is that I've asked all our speakers to include uh, references and, and papers so that those of you who want to learn more, you have access through the recorded talk to be able to download those uh, references or to see what people are referring to specifically. And I, I think, I hope you've seen today, there's a lot of dynamic work going on in the, in the greater Australian and New Zealand region, um, interdisciplinary, uh, highly collaborative, um, you know, cognizant of, uh, of the history in this region and, and also trying to really um, lead the way. So I'm really delighted and honored to have been able to feature some of the work that's being done by my colleagues. I'm going to ask Brett to put up our slide for next month's talk so that those of you who are interested can put that down in your calendars and also remind everybody about uh, the AAPA abstract deadline, which is coming up in just a couple days. And also our uh, Australasian Society for Human Biology deadline is a week after the AAPA deadline. So um, we really encourage you to consider joining us to learn more about some of the dynamic work in the area. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, everybody. This is wonderful. Thank you, Tanya.